I am not six foot five. <laughs> so I will do that and so you can hear me. Well, good evening. It's really good to be with you guys here. And, you know, this is, it's interesting. I, I have only been to South Dakota one time before in my life. It is a lovely state, and I had the, the blessing of driving across it today. We were in uh, Sioux Falls last night, had a great time together, but I am told that uh, Rapid City is the fun part of the state. Is that correct? <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. No, but I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, and, and I have had a chance to connect with some, uh, some old friends, Dale Barcher, who has been a friend for a long time, as well as uh, and, and, uh, Michael and Camille Pauly, if you don't know them yet. Thank you for welcoming Washington uh, exiles, those who have fled from the state of Washington and, and, and see, see some familiar faces here in a place that is not especially familiar to me, but I, I do love it here. And I'm, I'm really grateful to be here in, 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 the, in the conversations that we've had at my table. Everyone's from Iowa, it seems, but we got to talk about uh, sports a lot and uh, and in baseball and the playoffs, everybody know that the World Series is about to happen. Everybody agrees that the Astros are supposed to lose, right? Okay, right? What's the difference between uh, politics and baseball? Anybody know? In, in baseball, when you are caught stealing, you're out. All right? Be here all night, folks. <laughs> we do have some serious things to talk about, and, and I, I, I reckon if we did a survey of the room, everyone might be motivated by a slightly different issue. And you know, talked with the group before dinner about the fact that there's one thing that Democrats, Republicans, conservatives, liberals, however you want to describe the polls politically, there's one thing that we all agree on, and that is everything is messed up, right? We very quickly part ways about what's the cause of the problem, and then we disagree about what the solution to the problem is. And I think I just lost the microphone. Let's see what we can do here. Do we have a mic, a replacement, maybe? Because I think we just had a battery. So I'm gonna project for a second. While we wait for a new battery, that. Can you guys hear me in the back? Okay, we'll keep going. So we are not in agreement about what the problem is. Jesus did this for 5,000 people, right? He didn't have a mic, so we can go his <laughs> So we didn't agree what the problem what the problems are, and so we don't agree with what the solution to the problem should be. And the reason is because we are not fundamentally disagreeing about politics. I have 10 things I want to tell you tonight, and I'm going to do it quickly. And the first one is, this is fundamentally a religious war. Now, it's not a religious war in the sense that this is a crusade. How are we doing? Better? All right. We're back on. This is fundamentally a religious war in the sense that these are not, this is not religion versus secularism, atheism versus Christianity. These are competing worldviews that are functionally competing religions. Your worldview is defined by four things. What you believe about origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Where did I come from? Who determines what is right and wrong? Does my life have meaning and why? What happens when I die? There's lots of different answers to those questions. But the reason that you disagree with people politically is not because you prefer the color red or blue, primarily. It's because you have different assumptions about where you came from, what the purpose of your life is, who determines what is right and wrong, who determines what is truth. The left has an answer to those questions, the right has an answer to those questions, and of course there's, there's subgroups within each of those categories. But we have religious convictions, they have religious convictions, and if you doubt that, what are the components of any religious doctrine, religious set of beliefs. They have an origin story. You have creation, or you have naturalism, or evolution. Everyone's religion provides meaning. Is our purpose, is our meaning to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, or is it to end oppression and live authentically? Every 
religion, religious system, has an explanation for human nature. Is the problem that we are sinful? Or is it the problem that there are corrupt systems outside of us, and as soon as we fix the systems, we solve the problem? We have iconography as well. Some of us carry around crosses to represent our religious beliefs. Others have rainbow flags to represent our religious beliefs. We even have holidays. Many of us would celebrate Christmas and Easter. Others would celebrate Pride Month to celebrate the same different religious beliefs. We have sacraments. We have communion. Or we have something like abortion to celebrate our autonomy and our declaration of independence from any authority over ourselves. Secular religion even has its own form of excommunication. Anyone knows what that's called? Cancel culture. There are even creeds. There are even creeds. We would have like, we would claim the Apostles' Creed. They would say instead, my body, my choice. Some of you may have seen a recitation done by the medical students at the University of Minnesota recently. This uh, made the rounds on social media. A video of this where students, hundreds of them, who were about to graduate from medical school, and the thing that made this look particularly religious is they all had white coats on, and they stood and they recited the following. In unison, we commit to uprooting the legacy and perpetuation of structural violence deeply embedded in the healthcare system. We recognize inequities built by past and present traumas rooted in white supremacy, colonialism, the gender binary, ableism, and all forms of oppression. As we enter this profession with opportunity for growth, we commit to promoting a culture of anti-racism, listening and amplifying, amplifying voices for positive change. We pledge to honor all indigenous ways of healing that have been historically marginalized by Western medicine. Knowing that health is intimately connected to our environment, we commit to healing our planet and communities. This is the recitation that they are taking, which sounds similar but different than, I believe in God the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. I won't finish it, but you get the point different recitations for a different statement of faith, but a statement of faith, no less. The second point, the religion of secularism undermines the basis for equality. And this is some, something, this is quite ironic, because you have, today we have the people who are fighting most aggressively for a secularized culture with their right hand, with their left hand, fighting most aggressively for equality. Why is that inconsistent? Because the only basis that humanity has ever come up with for the idea of equality is the one that we have come up with in the Western world, and it's specifically enshrined in our founding documents, the fact that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. What is the basis of human equality if we are not created equal? Are we equally talented? Are we equally good-looking? Are we equally wealthy or resourced? Are we equally intelligent? Are we equally strong? On what basis are we equal? None, because we're not equal, which is why every civilization, until Christianity was introduced into the bloodstream of human societies, had no notion of human equality, because it's irrational if we are not created equal. So it's suicidal for us as a society to say, we want to remove God from our culture, yet we want to pursue human equality. And we see on the margins, because now the value of a person is rooted in what we can do at the beginning of life and at the end of life, we're deciding, well, you're not actually human. You might be, you, might, you aren't actually a person. The theory is, you're human, but you're not a person deserving of legal protection until you have sentience or you can do certain things. And if you can't, you no longer deserve protection. The third thing I want to say with respect to this religious war that we find ourselves in. There's a lot of conversation about Christian nationalism that I'm sure you have heard about. And this is a red herring, not 
a threat to democracy, despite what you've heard. And let me prove that to you. You may know about a man named Gavin Newsom, who is the governor, the former governor of many of your new residents from California, right? And there's a reason why they left. Well, Gavin Newsom has run a billboard campaign that I understand you in South Dakota are somewhat familiar with, right? Advertising the abundance and prevalence of abortion and his willingness for the California taxpayers to pay for people, not just to get an abortion in California, but they will fly you there now. They will fly you there. And on these billboards, what does he do, somewhat ironically, is he quotes the words of Jesus where he says, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. Now, of course, we like Jesus, and we like what Jesus says. And Governor Newsom's very clear implication is that if you love your neighbor, you will help your neighbor get an abortion when he, he, <laughs> you can actually say that, right? He would say that with a straight face. When he needs an abortion, go for it, right? Of course, we know better. Love your neighbor when she needs an abortion. Has anyone objected to Governor Newsom's clear use of scripture for political purposes? No. Why? Because they don't care if you're pushing in the right direction, Raphael Warnock, who's on the ballot, he's a current U.S. Senator from Georgia, on the ballot again, tells everyone he's a pro-choice pastor recently in a forum, was defending his position, and said essentially, it's not essentially, he said, God gave us choice in defense of the choice for abortion. And essentially, the argument that he was making is because God gave us the ability to choose. He doesn't care what we choose. He's just happy to see us exercising the ability to choose that he gave us. Of course, that's theologically nonsense because if God was indifferent to the choices we would make with the power to choose, then there would be no need for Jesus, would there? Because there's no sin and there's no need for redemption and all of that if all he is is sitting there happy to watch us make selections. Of course, that's not true, but to our point in the moment, nobody objects when Raphael Warnock invokes the name of God in support of abortion because no one cares if people make religious arguments for their purposes. Vice President Harris multiple times recently has been in churches not only making biblical arguments for support of abortion, but encouraging people to vote for the right candidates from their perspective in a church. Does anyone object? Of course not. Because the concern is not that people will use religious arguments for a political purpose. That's really normal. The fact is we're all trying to legislate morality. We're just legislating different morality. And when they accuse you and me of being Christian nationalists, what they want to do is make you ashamed of getting involved. And they want to bully you into silence and submission and retreat by intentionally misunderstanding you so that you will create a vacuum that they can happily fill. They aren't objecting to people motivated by religious ideas. They're not afraid of Christian nationalism. They're afraid of Christians. And what Christians will do if they assert the authority responsibly, lovingly, that God has given them in our community. Don't fall for it. If you're worried that you might be in bad company, let me give you uh, some consolation. John Hancock said, Sensible of the importance of Christian piety and virtue to the order and happiness of a state, I cannot but earnestly commend to you every measure for their support and encouragement. John Adams our Constitution was made for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the governance of any other. George Washington, it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor. What would the ladies of The View do if someone said that today? Outrage, no doubt. So take great comfort knowing that you are in great company. The fourth point I want to make today the church needs to stop outsourcing the education and discipleship of our kids. The 
the opportunity that we have right now in America for education reform is supernatural. It is miraculous, and I want us to all grasp what has happened over the last couple of years. We know what has happened with COVID, and we know that COVID pulled back the curtain for what's going on in our schools, and a lot of parents became really frustrated, and like no time in America's history, we are interested in alternatives, in alternatives. At precisely the same moment where God was giving us a window into this system and creating interest in alternatives, the Supreme Court came down with a couple decisions. But essentially what they said is if your state has a school choice program, you may not discriminate against religious organizations. What does this mean? This means that when South Dakota passes a school choice bill that takes all the money that the state is currently sending to the government school, that same money can go with the child to the church school that your church is going to start, right? Between kindergarten and 12th grade, children will spend 16,000 hours in a classroom if they go every day. 16,000 hours. That is having a tremendous impact on the hearts, minds, and souls of our kids, and we see evidence of it every day. But it doesn't have to happen that way now because we can use the same dollar that we send to have them be educated by the drag queen down the street and put them in our churches to be educated for 16,000 hours as well. The only reason that will not happen is because we don't put in the effort to make it happen. We pass the legislation, we start the schools, we disciple our own kids. That's how we rebuild America. My fifth point, if we want to do this, if we want to be effective in the world that we live in, we have to surrender our reputations. In my past life, I had a job that was very similar to Norman's. I ran the Family Policy Institute of Washington, and I did that in, in Washington State for 10 years. And I began that job in 2008. And leading up to when I was considering this job, I was in a Bible study with a group of guys I kind of knew what this organization was about to do. Same-sex marriage wasn't a thing anywhere yet. It was about domestic partnerships, but you could kind of see where things were headed. And as I was discussing whether this was something I was interested in, I verbalized to these guys I was in a Bible study with. I said, you know, I just don't know if I want to be anti-gay marriage guy in Washington State. And I wasn't necessarily afraid of the position because that's... I mean, I, I believed in God's understanding of marriage, but I didn't want that to necessarily be my thing, you know? I didn't want that to be what I was known for, that the first thing anybody would know about me is he hates gay people, because that's, of course, how that's framed, though it, of course, is not true. And a handful of times in my life that God has spoken to me, and this was one of them, and he said, you need to surrender your reputation. And I know it was God because I'd never thought about it before. It's like, what does that even mean, right? I'm a pastor's kid. I'd been in church my whole life. I'd learned about surrendering my money and my dreams and all sorts of things. But nobody ever talked to me about surrendering my reputation. And what I realized in that moment is there was this thing that I prized very highly and that I wanted to protect. It was invisible, but it was very valuable to me. And that was the way people thought of me. And what God revealed to me in that moment is that if you value that thing that other people can destroy quite easily, if you value that, you will not be useful to me. And he said, you need to give that to me. Let me take care of it. And if people think poorly of you, so be it. As long as I'm pleased. That's all that matters. And so... And so that day, I got on my knees, and I surrendered my reputation. For those of you who are pastors in the room, I would encourage you to lead your congregations in this effort because it was the single best thing that I've ever done in my life. 
Because the moment I decided that wasn't my concern anymore and that God was going to handle what people thought about me, that was the moment, as far as I'm concerned, that I really began to live. And here's the thing. I went on to run a marriage campaign in Washington State, and all of the things that I was afraid might happen to me happened. All of them. I was misrepresented, threatened, maligned. My Google history is ruined, right? I'm unemployable by 95% of America's employers, and I know that, right? And that's the truth. But what I wasn't conscious of but have since learned is that when you give the things to God that he asks you for, what you get in return is so much better, is so much better. And... And the people, the people, the relationships, the opportunities, when I planted my flag and I said, here I stand, I can do no other apologies to the Catholic brethren in the room. When I said that, people came running from everywhere because both fear and courage are contagious. If you want to change South Dakota or you want to preserve South Dakota, however you want to see that, it will happen if South Dakota is filled with a church that has surrendered its reputation and is unconcerned what anybody thinks about you other than Jesus. Six. <laughs> Closely following that, tend your garden. We look at the problems around us, and it's overwhelming. And what most of the world has done, most of the country has done, has said, it's too big, I can't wrap my head around it, it scares me, I'm just going to close my eyes, bury my head in the sand, and hope it all goes away, or passes by me. And the reality is the problems are too big for us. They're too big for me, they're too big for you. Individually, we cannot solve this. And the blessing is, we understand that the government is not on our shoulders, it is on God's shoulders, right? And so we don't have to carry that burden, but... He has put us, each of us, in a garden, gardens of various size. And what each of us can do is make our little patch of dirt a little better. And when each of us does that for a little while, we all put our heads up for a while after a moment of labor, and wouldn't you know, the garden looks a little better, right? So relieve yourself of the burden from solving all the world's problems because you can't do that. No one expects you to. But you do have an assignment and if you don't know what it is, just listen and God will show you after a few minutes. And do that thing. Do the next right thing. And you will contribute to making the world a better place. And if all the church just steps into whatever God has put in front of us, we will make it better. Roe took 50 years to overturn. Millions, perhaps billions of dollars. Millions of man hours of lobbying efforts, of legislation efforts, of electioneering, of getting people on the Supreme Court, right? Takes a long time to do good things. But they'll never be done if we don't each tend our garden. Seven, closely related to this. Sometimes bad news is good news. You just haven't recognized yet. And I want to illustrate this. I just referred to Roe. And we are all still celebrating, amen, the fact that the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade with Dobbs. But I want to back up a bit and remind us how this happened. Take you back to January of 2016. And you might not remember, but you do remember that in February, sorry, of 2016, Justice Antonin Scalia died. And when I got that news, I was disheartened, biblical term perhaps for that, um, because from my vantage point at that point, in six months before that, seven months before that, the Supreme Court had passed the Obergefell decision, they redefined marriage, the Supreme Court was already in a bad place, Justice Robert was the most recent Republican nominee, and he was sketchy, and Justice Kennedy had become a reliable vote for the sexual revolution, was not at all confident where the Supreme Court was, but Justice Scalia was somebody that I knew I could count on. And then God took him. And I was like, he has, in, in a Romans 1 sense, he has turned us over, right, to our, to our desires. And he's just going to let us reap what we have sown. That was my sentiment. Because why? Who was in the White House? President Obama, he was going to fill this vacancy as far as I could tell, and I had 
complete confidence that he was going to replace Justice Scalia with somebody who was not like Justice Scalia, right? And what was the alternative? Even if somehow the Republican majority in the Senate managed to prevent Obama from filling that seat, I mean, there were 16 Republicans, and increasingly it was looking like Donald Trump was going to be the nominee, and every ounce of conventional political wisdom told us that as soon as Trump becomes the nominee, that just guarantees the ascension of Hillary Clinton, and then, you know, we're basically Iran. And so I was depressed, because this looked like the end in so many ways. Because it wasn't just, I mean, we'd always hoped that Roe versus Wade would be overturned, but at that point, we're trying to figure out, are we going to be able to stay out of prison? for being Christians, right? Because we got bakers and florists, and we got people getting fired all over the place, and the White House says, yeah, yeah, fire them, right? That's where we're at, and so we're looking for a Supreme Court that's just going to keep the First Amendment alive. And this was looking increasingly unlikely. But we know what happened, right? Because Mitch McConnell, not my favorite U.S. Senator, but he held the seat open for nine months, which had never been done before, and we all know that President Trump became the nominee, and as skeptical as many of us were, we were like, well, it's the devil I don't know, which just seems a little bit better than the devil I do know. I know I'm not going to vote for her, so, you know, let's roll the dice. Why not? Let's see what happens, because there's an open seat on the vacant on the Supreme Court, and the best thing I can hope is maybe the guy would actually do what he says with the Supreme Court. And I know there were millions of people just like me that voted for that guy to be our president. And did he do it? You bet he did it. Not once, but three times. Three times. And why did all of that happen? What was the first domino? Justice Scalia died. What looked like terrible news to me, God had a different plan for, and sometimes we need to wait. But really, I should have known this, because Scripture gives us another really good example of this. When Jesus was on the cross, it didn't look like he was winning. That's not what any of us would have defined as victory. And his apostles certainly didn't look at that as victory. But just understand that in God's world, in God's currency, sometimes victory looks like defeat temporarily. And we need to let him see it through and just be faithful. Number eight, love people the way God wants you to, not the way the world wants you to. When we get involved in this stuff, there's this... Gospel of niceness that I hear often in the church, which there's some version, and, and of course, we know that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, those are the fruit of the Spirit, and that should define our character as individuals. But niceness is not a Christian virtue. Kindness is, and love is. And what's happened, it's close, the, the gospel of niceness is closely related to the gospel of tolerance. And the, and, and the gospel of tolerance says that the way you love people is by doing the things that they want you to do, by making them happy. Now, those of us who are parents of children or ever have been, we know that sometimes the worst thing you can do for your child is give them exactly what they want, right? And so in that context, we understand that, and it feels patronizing to talk about that in terms of our neighbors. But here's the thing. Everybody is pro-love in America. You have hashtag love is love, right? And then we have 1 Corinthians 13. And there's a great deal of overlap, in fact, because love is patient, is kind, it does not seek its own, right? And everybody's like, yay, love. But 1 Corinthians 13, 6 is where the two paths in the woods diverge. Because what does it say? It says, love does not rejoice in iniquity. It rejoices in the truth. That's God's definition of love. God's definition of love says we hate evil and we love what is good. So in God's definition of love, hate is one of the things that we experience and we express appropriately toward the right things, right? And our hatred of the wrong things is because of our love of the good things. And you can't, th those are two sides of the same coin and you can't have one without the other. And so the world is begging us to love them the way they want us to which means tell them the things they want to hear, say the things that will avoid conflict, don't impose on anybody's desire to live authentically. What Jesus says is that love does not rejoice in iniquity, it rejoices in the truth. 
And what we do have to do as a church, when we engage in this space, when we talk to our neighbors, when we talk to our friends, we have to make the decision, am I going to love my neighbor, which we must, am I going to love my neighbor the way Jesus wants me to or the way they want me to? And here's the thing, it will be misunderstood, which takes us back to surrender your reputation. It shouldn't matter. It's guaranteed because Jesus promised us that they would hate us on account of him, right? So we shouldn't be surprised by any of that because of the spiritual war that we're in. But we need to be conscious of God's definition of love compared to the world's definition of love. Nine, fear God and nothing else. Fear God and nothing else. And I'm going to quote Oswald Chambers as I develop this. He says, the remarkable thing about fear is that if you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. Right? Proverbs tells us that the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. When you know who your God is, when you know who, what he is capable of, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you can stare at a burning, fiery furnace and say, do whatever you want to do. Because my God can deliver me from your hand, but even if he doesn't, I will not worship your idols. And we know what happened in that story. They turned over, they changed the heart's king and changed all of, they, they changed the king's heart and all of Babylon. Why? Because they were brilliant? No, because they believed God was capable of doing the things that he said he could do, and they were not going to worship the false gods that they were offered the opportunity to worship as a way of preserving themselves. Here's the thing. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, a quick note on that. In that culture, it was a polytheistic culture, right? Nebuchadnezzar knew that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were Jews. He knew that they had Jewish observances. That's what the whole first two chapters are about, right? Is their commitment to Yahweh. He didn't care. He just wanted them to worship their gods as well. Same thing with the Christians in Rome. Caesar didn't care that they were Christians and worshipped Jesus. The problem was that they said, there's no king but Jesus. The world does not hate us because of who we worship. They hate us because of the gods we refuse to worship. They have an idol in the middle of the square, and it carries a rainbow flag. And they say, prove your allegiance by bowing down. And when we don't, that's when it causes problems. We can say we're Christians. We can go to church. We can sing songs. We can quote the Bible. And as long as we pay our pound of pinch of incense to their gods, they're fine with us. They'll even hold us up as examples of the good Christians because we worship their gods too. And, of course, that's not a choice God actually gives us. But that's the offer being made. And like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we say no because we believe that God can rescue us from anything they threaten us with, and that's what changed the country. Number 10, remember what you're for, not just what you're against. What are we fighting for? When we are opposed to pornographic sex education curriculum in our sixth grade classroom, it's not because we hate somebody. It's because we love their innocence and we want to protect our children. When we are opposed to abortion, though we certainly are, it's because we love life, and it's because of what we're for. Jeremiah 29, 7 tells a nation of Israel that actually lived in exile that we are to seek the welfare of the city that we're sent to. That word welfare is shalom, which you're surely familiar with. It appears in the Bible 429 times, shalom. And I'm going to read you a description of this that I hope will encourage you from a man named Alvin Plantinga. This is what we are for as we engage in this effort. And he writes, The great writing prophets of the Bible knew how many ways human life had gone wrong because they knew how many ways human life can go right. And they dreamed of a time when God would put things right again. They dreamed of a new age in which crookedness would be straightened out and rough places made plain. The foolish would be made wise and the wise humble. They dreamed of a time when the deserts would flower, the mountains would stream with red wine, a time when weeping would be heard no more, and when people could sleep without weapons on their laps. People could work in peace, their work having meaning and point. A wolf could lie down with a lamb, the wolf cured of all carnivorous appetite. All nature would be fruitful, benign, and filled with wonder upon wonder, 
all humans would be knit together in brotherhood and sisterhood. And all nature and all humans would look to God, walk with God, lean toward God, and delight in God. Their shouts of joy and recognition welling up from valleys and crags, from women in streets and from men on ships. The webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight is what the Old Testament prophets called shalom. We call it peace, but it means much more than mere peace of mind or a ceasefire among enemies. In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness, and a delight, rich state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as its creator and savior opens doors and welcomes the creatures in whom he delights. We are now fallen creatures in a fallen world. The Christian gospel tells us that all hell has broken loose in this sorry world, but also that in Christ, all heaven has come to do battle. Christ the warrior has come to defeat worldly powers, to move the world over onto a new foundation, and to equip a people informed, devout, educated, pious, determined people to follow him in righting what's wrong, in transforming what's corrupted, and doing the things that make for peace. That's why we're here. Thank you for doing your part so that we can pray and see the answer to that prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God bless you all.